do you do? Not when it's your brother or your sister. What do you do when it's the enemy you envy? What do you do when the grass looks greener on the Like, it doesn't seem beneficial to me. Sitting in this pew doesn't seem to pay off all the time. The heathen doing better than the whole. Everything that glitters hidden from God. Amen. As we grow and as we develop in our relationship with the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that it is necessary for us to examine ourselves periodically in order to ensure that we're on the right track. Although we are saved and we're sanctified and we are filled with the precious Holy Spirit, even as seasoned saints, even as veteran church members, I believe every now and then it is necessary for us to pull to the side and examine if we're still on the right track. It's so easy sometimes without even knowing it to veer off the right path. Because every day we're being pulled in so many different directions, so many different forces that are at us and pulling at us. We've got television and internet now, such a critical part of our culture. And even with our young people all the way to the most seasoned of us, we're constantly being confronted with the temptation to conform. You got pressures from other people. You got suggestions from society. Have I got a witness here? And sometimes it puts you in a conflict as a Christian because even though you are not of this world, the reality is we still got to live in this world. Talk to me here. Even though we are spiritual, there are carnal forces that are always at work. Even though the Bible declares and we believe that we are children of God and children that are not of this world, the fact of the matter is we still live in this world. And so that's the dilemma that David finds himself in this morning because even as the leader of God's people, what we see in the first three verses is that even kings have conflicts. Tell somebody, kings have conflicts. Two points I want to give you up front. First of all, we have the strength in the body, but then we have the struggle in the believer. I'm ready to teach this morning. I said, we have the strength in the body, but then you have the struggle in the belief. Understand that one of them speaks of the whole. That's the strength in the body. But then the other part only speaks to one part of the whole. Here it is. Verse 1, David says, truly, God is good to Israel. You'll see it in a minute. Even to such as are of a clean heart. That's the body that he's talking about. Truly, when we look around, God has been good to us. He's talking about the collective congregation of the people of God. He says God has been good to Israel. There's no denying that. Even in our corporate setting, he has blessed us. He has delivered us just like Israel. He has brought us out of bondage. When you look around, nobody here can deny the fact that God has been good to Israel. I wish I had a little more noise on a Sunday morning. I say God corporately has been good to us. Uh, however, in lieu of the corporate testimony of the body, verse 2 reveals the struggle with David as a believer. 
Again, truly, God has been good to Israel. But in verse 2, he says, but as for me. See, he's being real honest about where he is at the time. And I believe it is beneficial to the believer that all of us be honest about where we are this moment. He says, yes, truly God has been good to Israel, the strength of the body. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. He said, my steps had well nigh slipped. Is there anybody other than me this morning who has ever had a situation where corporately we are doing well, but as for me, I, I need some prayers this morning. It, it's not to deny, it's not to diminish, it's not to dismiss what God is doing for us, but even now in the midst of this worship service, there's a part of me that can't help but focus on my own struggles. I, I need to talk to the people this morning who know that yes, God has been good to us. God has been good as a church. I'm not arguing with that. God has blessed Jacob Chapel, but as for me, I'm not separating myself from y'all. I love the body. I'm not trying to drag you down with my issues. But I'd be lying if I sat up in here Sunday after Sunday and, and try not to admit that problems don't affect me. That's what I'm trying to get to this morning. Hear me now. He says, yes, we got plenty of reasons to rejoice. But sometimes it's hard to shout for we when there's so much going on with me. I wish I had some help in here. Is there somebody here who come with this something this morning? Come with that issue this morning? Come with that struggle this morning? Yes, he's been good to we. But tell your neighbor, me got some issues. See? Listen, listen, I need, I need an honest crowd here. I am far from a hater. And I don't believe you're a hater either. We have no problem celebrating God's goodness in each other's lives. But sometimes when we get in here on Sunday, I'm spiritual enough to shout for we. But when it comes to me, I'm over here tripping. Do y'all feel what I'm saying here? Like genuinely, you're happy for your brother. Genuinely, you're happy for your sister. I understand this thing about we, but according to David, he says, I'm over here tripping. How do I know? It's right there in the Bible. He says, as for me, not denying what's happening with us, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. He says, I'm tripping. That's, that's, that, that, that's the O.J. Simmons, you know, version of, of what it says. He said, I, I, my feet were almost gone, and my steps had well nigh slipped. Brothers and sisters, there has to be a way, and this is where I'm trying to help you early in the morning. There has to be a way for us as a church to celebrate the body without sacrificing the believer. You hear what I'm saying? may not make sense yet. Publicly, we're strong. But privately, some of us are struggling. Publicly, we're a strong body, as well we should be. But privately, we got stuff going on. As an entity, we're straight. But as an individual, there's at least 12 of us in here who can say, my feet are almost gone. Uh, I'm sorry if I woke you up too early, but, but somebody's going to appreciate this sermon because as for you, I'm talking about your stability. That's what your feet represent, your confidence, your standing as a person. There's got to be a way for us to strive as a body and still acknowledge the struggle of the believer. As, my, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well not slipped. Even though there are blessings all around me, I got to be honest about the burdens that are in me. You see, that's, that's, that's the environment that we have to learn how to cultivate within the church because even though corporately we are strong, we have got to allow room, we got to allow space, we got to allow an honest place for people to come and vent their struggles. 
David said, I ain't, I ain't denying it. Now, God been good to Israel. I appreciate him for that. I'm a part of Israel. I'm the king of Israel. He been good to us, but privately, I'm struggling within myself. Hmm. Well, what is his dilemma? What, what, what is he? What is he tripping about? Why are his feet slipping? Why, why are his steps well nigh, you know, out of place? What, what is he tied up in knots about? Verse 3 says, I'm tripping because I was envious at the foolish uh -huh, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It's going to help you. In other words, I looked at myself as a believer, and then I compared my life to folk out there specifically worldly people. And when I looked over the fence at my neighbor's situation, it looks like they got all the glitter and I got all the grief. Can anybody be honest and admit that sometimes it is a little bit more attractive out there? They seem to have it a little bit better than we do. Let me paraphrase the next eight verses for you again. This is another rendition, but you can follow me in your King James Version. He says, God, look at what they got going on over there. They don't suffer no pain. Their bodies are healthy. They have no drudgery in their lives like the rest of us do. They ain't plagued with problems like I am. They wear their arrogance like a necklace around their neck and acts of violence like fancy clothing. Anybody ever felt like that? Like, man, these people ain't got a care in the world. Don't seem like they struggling with nothing. I'm at verse 7 now. Their eyes peer out from their fat faces. Their imaginations run wild. They ridicule. They speak maliciously. They speak arrogantly. Sounds like the haves ridiculing the have-nots. I wish I had some help in here. They verbally attack heaven. In verse number nine, they order people around like the world belongs to them. That's why God's people turn to wickedness, he says, because it seems easier to just go along to get along. He says the wicked people ask, what does God know? Does the most high know anything? Look at how wicked they are. They never have a worry. They grow more and more wealthy every day. Here he is looking over the fence. And it would be all right if this was one of his brothers or sisters. Talk to me here. See, look, what good does it do to serve God and still got to go through all this trouble? I mean, we sit up in here Sunday after Sunday, we shout, and by 1.30, the devil back on our track again. I'm, I'm going to help you with that in a minute. Don't, don't let me forget. I told you that. I said by 1.30, the devil is back on our track again. What do you do? Not when it's your brother or your sister. What do you do when it's the enemy you envy? Mm -hmm. What do you do when the grass looks greener on Satan's side? Nobody ever been there. Like, it doesn't seem beneficial to be a believer sometimes. Sitting in this pew doesn't seem to pay off all the time. The heathen doing better than the holy. Sure has some help here. The ratchet come out better than the righteous. And at what point, David is asking, at what point does God even the score between the haves and the have not? I don't know about y'all, but I'm telling you, it's hard being a Christian in this culture. You know why? Because it seems like we always end up on the short end. I, 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 I don't talk about just other people in general. I'm just saying when we look at the culture, it just feels like sometimes that the heathen can rage on and then the faithful people, the ones that are really trying to do it the right way. I don't hear them talking about sacrifice. No, that's us over here. I don't hear them talking about giving up nothing. I don't see them turning the other cheek. They get to slap back. Why can't I? Talk to me here. They, they, they get to retaliate. Why can't I? I don't hear the world talking about forgive. I don't hear the world talking about give somebody a hand up. 
I don't hear the world concerned about justice and fairness across the board. What good is it for us to follow God if the world gets all the glitter and we get all the grief? Herein lies the conflict because I know that God has been good to us. But am I wrong for feeling what I feel? Verse 13 says, I've received no reward for keeping my life pure. I've received no kudos from Christ for living a chaste life. He said, I got problems every day. And every morning my punishment begins again. That's why for some of us, it gets on our nerves when we hear folk complaining. Because it's like you have no idea what a bad day is, and you steady fussing and carrying on. You fussing about your family, at least you got a family. Hush with that foolishness. You fussing about a job, at least you got a job. Try struggling for six months trying to keep your lights on. Try sitting in a lonely house with nobody to talk to and nobody to check on you. You have no idea what a bad day is until you interview everybody in here to find out how their day went. It bothers us when we hear people complain, but every now and then we have our own moments where we feel that way about life. As a congregation, I'm just about done. We've been conditioned to contain our complaints. I'm going to say it again. It's going to be therapeutic for you. I said, as a congregation, we have been conditioned throughout the years to contain, to hold in, to keep back, to be quiet about our complaints. Look at verse 15. He says, if I keep talking like this out loud, I would have betrayed God's people and be a stumbling block for them. In other words, he said, I'm the leader. He says, I'm the one that they look to. So if I show any weakness, if I show any vulnerability as a leader, then the folk who follow me will stumble. What David is saying is, I've been conditioned to contain my complaint. In other words, I got to keep my game face on. Because people are watching me. I got to put my Sunday morning face on because people depend on me. Have you ever felt like people depend on you to hold it together? Is there anybody other than me that has ever felt trapped by the expectations of other people? Have you ever felt lost in your own identity? Because most times you're really not being yourself. You're just being who everybody needs you to be. I wish I had some help in here this morning. Your family got expectations. Your loved ones got expectations. Your friends got expectations. Whoever you in a relationship with got expectations. Church folk got expectations. Pastor got expectations. I don't care how strong you are. It's hard being everything to everybody. I'm talking to the one that you're the strongest one in your family and nobody ever asked you how you're doing. I'm talking to the one where your phone don't ring until somebody needs something and they never reciprocate what it is you've given. I'm talking to the ones that always be that shoulder for everybody else to lean on. But what happens when your shoulder hurts and you need to lean on something? Is there anybody here ever felt trapped because you've had to contain your complaints? You ain't having the best day right now. But folk look at you and they say, what it is you complaining about? Why you not smile? Why you not? Because sometimes I have my day. <laughs> Encourage your neighbor and tell him you're allowed those days. You're, you're, you're allowed those days. God told me to tell you this morning. That's why you came to this service. You're allowed those days. You allowed them moments where you don't answer your phone. And you need to stop apologizing for it. Stop letting people guilt you uh, into being there everything uh, when you got needs yourself. Uh, you have my permission. Uh, you have God's permission uh, to go in your secret closet uh, and pray until you feel better. Uh, you got my permission to act as funny sometimes uh, as you want to act uh, until you and God get this thing straight. I can't be all things uh, to all people. Sometimes uh, I gotta have my moment. That's why I pray for our members every day. Because some of you are trying to be corporately supportive, but you're still struggling individually. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm talking about the good things that are happening to us, but it still don't speak to what's happening with you. Pastor, 
I hear what you're saying about this pay off the mortgage stuff, but what about my mortgage? See how quiet it gets right up in there? I, I support what's going on corporately, but what about my bills? What about my family? What about my issue? My struggle? I love we, but what about me? Wish y'all would be honest with me this morning. David is torn about it. I'm closing now because he allowed himself to get sidetracked with other people's success. He said, I got caught tripping because I was so focused on what seemed like the glitter from the world. But before I go ahead and solve your problem, we all need to thank God for this, that he allows us every now and then to vent our frustrations. Maybe you can't appreciate that, but I appreciate them moments where God let me get in the car, roll up the windows, and just holler all I want to. Somebody better talk to me here. You better appreciate them times where God let you close your door, turn your light off, put your face in a pillar, and holler as much as you want. You better thank God for that space that he gives you because every one of us gets mad sometimes. Every one of us have a crisis sometimes. Every saint reaches a point where you sick and tired or being sick and tired. Somebody will talk to me here. You ought to thank God for allowing you to vent every now and then. God, thank you for that space. Thank you for that time. Thank you that you didn't whoop me when I ran my mouth. Thank you, God, that you didn't strike me down because I was venting because every now and then it's human to let that stuff out. Maybe you wouldn't be so, see, I'm glad I didn't say that. Maybe you wouldn't be so contained if you learned how to go to God more and just be honest. You can worship more freely when you take that church mask off. You know what? T t tell somebody around you, because they have sleep. Tell your neighbor, I am not all right all the time. So, some, somebody going to help, help me after a while. I, I am not happy all the time. I am not glory, glory all the time. That's just not my reality. I go through stuff. I deal with stuff. I struggle with stuff. Some days I wake up, I ain't feeling none of y'all. I'm trying to tell you, it be one of them days, it be one of them weeks, it be one of them seasons, and you better thank God for letting you be honest. Uh, right about now. Now that you've had a chance to express your dissatisfaction, you done fussed or I done fussed. Y'all just sat and look at me fuss. We done vented. We have lamented our lot in life. Now God is going to show you why none of your misery is merited. I let you vent, didn't I? <laughs> You just said it's all right for me to vent, Pastor, and I agree. But when you have a right relationship with God, when have you ever known God to let your word be the last word? I let you vent, I let you fuss, I let you put your face in the pillow and scream. You got in the car, roll up the window, and you said every ungodly word that you wanted to when them folk messed with you at that job. But don't get mad and miss the message. <laughs> David went through 16 verses of moaning and groaning. And again, God allowed it. Didn't strike him down because he was in his feelings. He just let him go through whatever emotion he felt was necessary. But I'm glad as I prepare to close, God has a way of checking your rage and showing you reality. Here's what I've been trying to get to. When you get done being envious of what other folk have, God's got a way of showing you that everything that glitters ain't from God. That's what I've been trying to get to. Verse 17, he says, I was angry. I was bitter. I was jealous. I was hostile. But then I took a look around me and all it took was a ride to church. 
He says, it wasn't until I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood the reality of so-called rich people. He says, now I see their prosperity in a whole new light. And what they don't realize is that they're on a slippery slope towards destruction. Somebody ought to help me close here. Just as quick as some people get all of that stuff, God can take it away from them in the blink of an eye. I wish I had a witness here. All the stuff that people take for granted, God God's going to remind them of who's really in charge. You ought to know by now that God allows it to rain on the just as well as the unjust. And just because God has not responded yet uh -huh, doesn't mean that he's not aware of what's going on. Can I hurry to tell you on my way to breakfast that everything that glitters ain't necessarily from God? Everything that you're seeing out there and you envy them and you want to be like them and you get jealous of your brothers and your sisters, let me tell you something. It's not until you show up to church that God gives you the reality in the midst of your rage. He reminds us that all money ain't from the master. Talk to me here. All wealth is not the will of God. All gifts are not necessarily from God, and all riches don't make you righteous. No, God's got a way of showing you the truth about the people you envy. Yeah, the grass may be green, but in some cases, it's astroturf. Anybody been around long enough now to know that some plants are fake, and some flowers are artificial yeah the house is big but God says the foundation is shaky and so as I close you better be careful about looking across the fence yeah because you never know how stable the foundation of that house really is I can understand a single person in here wanting to be married but please understand, uh, don't look at TV marriages. And sure enough, don't look at church marriages to try to figure out how the rest of your life uh, ought to be like. Because if the truth be told, uh, some married folk ain't slept in the same bed uh, for the last 12 years. Because everything, I wish I had a witness here, that glitters uh, ain't from God. Uh, there are some people who cuss each other out all the way to church. And then they come out the car smiling when they walk in the sanctuary. Have I got a witness here? Because God has a way of showing you that everything that glitters ain't always from him. You look at people that drive how you wish you could drive. But then you realize that they're three months behind on the payments. And they hide the car at somebody else's house to keep the repo man from taking it away. Have I got a witness here? You look at people uh, that seem to have everything, uh, but then you realize uh, that even with the stuff they have, uh, those people are still uh, not satisfied. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that's made up in your mind uh, that I may not have uh, all of what the world has, uh, but I'm satisfied? with what the Lord has given me. Have I got a witness here? The Bible says there are some that trust in chariots. There are some that trust in horses. But he said we will remember the name of the Lord. Is there anybody here that remembers the name of God? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest refrain, but holy leans greater on Jesus' name. Oh, Christ! 
not the Bank of America. Oh, Christ, not Chrysler Dodge. Oh, Christ, not the mortgage company. But oh, Christ, the solid rock I stand. Oh, all of the ground, yeah, sinking sand. Oh, Lord, your enemies didn't wake you up this morning. Your neighbors didn't start you on your way. Your family didn't die on a cross for you. Your friends didn't save you from your sin. Stop looking over your fence and sweep around your own front door. Oh, Lord, nobody but Jesus gave you what you have today. Jesus paid it all. Oh, to him I owe. He died on a hill called Calvary and he lives way down in my heart. Good morning now, y'all. I think the sun coming up now. Is there anybody here made up in your mind if God is all I have. Tell your neighbor that's all I need. Oh Lord, why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you shake somebody? Tell them the other way. If God is all you have. Tell them you can make it through the month. Oh, Lord, if God is all you got, you can win the battle. If God is all you have, you can praise through your problems. Oh, Lord, shake a better neighbor. Tell them if God is all I got, that's enough to shout me right now. I can shout through my struggles. I can sing through any situation. I can dance through any dilemma. Tell somebody if God doesn't do another thing for me, tell him he does. 